Hanford Collapse, Hunger Strike, and the Brewery Wars. Plus, this day in history with the Astor Place Riot and our Song of the Day by Rack and Rostam on your Morning Monarchy for May 10th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to wherever you are for media brought to you by you. Still fighting a cold, and I even messed up my intro music there, but I hope you're doing well on this Wednesday, May 10th, for your Food World Order edition of your Morning Monarchy. Again, I'm James Evan Pilato, coming to you, as always, from the Media Monarchy Studios up here in Portland, Oregon. Of course, dangerously close to the Hanford Nuclear Waste Site. We're going to talk about that and so much more on your delicious, nutritious Food World Order edition of your Morning Monarchy. Huge thanks to all our patrons and supporters and donors and cheerleaders and everybody. MediaMonarchy.com slash support has the links for the PayPal, the Patreon, the Bitcoin, and the post office box. Did I thank Russell F. yesterday? I think I did. But it's it's worth thanking Russell F. again. He's our latest patron at patron dot, Patreon.com slash MediaMonarchy. I sound a little stuffed up, don't I? Feeling a bit better this morning. I think basically my cold or sinus infection or I don't know what I got. Slowly working its way up my head and now I just kind of feel headachey. But nothing's going to stop me from bringing you listener-supported media. Huge thanks to the Truth Seeker app and RadioConfluence.com for carrying your morning monarchy and a lot of the other media monarchy broadcasts. So as I've been noting, each and every morning, I think one of the causes of whatever sickness I'm battling this week is I rearranged the home studio and kicked up all kinds of dust and dust bunnies and hairs and all kinds of things, and I've been fighting that since the weekend. But all of that is predicated on what I've been telling you all week. Mixler the platform that we've been using to do your Media Monarchy broadcasts. They're dropping the paywall one week from today, May 17th, and I imagine Mixler's probably going to be a pretty different place come next week. There will be no more free broadcasting. So instead of paying money to Mixler, I've been working behind the scenes with friends and associates to build our own stream, and it is going right now, and hey, I've got more people on there than we've had so far. You can find the link for the stream, and again, we are still working on that behind the scenes. But it's right there at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Ideally, nothing's hopefully really going to change all that much for you. You can still go to MediaMonarchy.com slash listen and get the show. So you can open that link up in iTunes, up in your VLC. You can even play it in a browser. Some browsers, I think. So we're also looking at new chat opportunities as well. And again, we're working on all that behind the scenes. If you've got any super sweet ideas, love to hear from you. You can always reach out James at MediaMonarchy.com. And, of course, we're on Skype and Wire as well, using MediaMonarchy.com. Not just uh, Media Monarchy. There's no .com. It is Wednesday morning. It's May 10th, a couple minutes after 9 a.m., and we are coming to you from the Media Monarchy Studios. It's very bright. I had to pull all the shades. I can't see the computer screen. Hope you're doing well whenever, wherever you are. If you're listening live, if you're in a cube, if you're in a car, if you're in a garden, we're glad you're here for listener-supported media. We do have a delicious, nutritious menu of news for you. But let's glance at the breaking lamestream news before we dive into it. Of course, firing FBI Director Comey. That happened yesterday after we were off the air here, and that's typically the way things go. And that's exactly how it happened also with Hanford yesterday. Not a lot of breaking news seems to happen while we're doing the morning news show. Most of the news all seems to really start to break when we're doing the music show in the afternoon. You get an hour of news in the morning as your morning monarchy, and an hour of music in the afternoon that we call pump up the volume. So, Trump fired Comey. I know, Bill Clinton fired his FBI director as well. Things are getting crazy. It's, you know, somewhat enjoyable to watch. Schadenfreude, I suppose. McConnell defends Trump as Schumer calls for special prosecutor. Windows 10 installed on 500 million machines. And Troll America, Hunger Games continue to happen pretty much everywhere. Fist fight erupts on Southwest Jet as it taxis to the gate in Burbank, California. Is that Bob Hope Airport? I've been there. So I wasn't planning on starting this way, but one of those news stories I see, and it's not just because it knows I'm from West Virginia. It's just one of the top stories. Because again, we're Troll America. A veteran West Virginia reporter has been arrested and charged with disruption of government services in the state capitol for yelling questions at visiting Health and Human Services Secretary Tom Price and White House Senior Advisor Kellyanne Conway. Daniel Ralph Heyman, 54 with the Public News Service of West Virginia was freed on $5,000 bail Tuesday night on a charge of willful disruption of government processes, according to a criminal complaint. The above defendant was aggressively breaching the Secret Service agents to the point where the agents were forced to remove him a couple of times from the area walking up the hallway into the main building of the Capitol. 
It adds that Heyman caused a disturbance by yelling questions at Ms. Conway and Secretary Price. The misdemeanor carries a possible fine of 100 bucks and six months in jail. Heyman later told reporters he was trying to do my job by pressing the secretary on whether domestic violence would be considered a pre-existing condition under the proposed American Health Care Act. Heyman, a veteran reporter who covers health issues for public news service, said he was holding his phone out to record the impromptu hallway interview, but Price repeatedly refused to respond. He didn't say anything, so I persisted. Heyman told reporters at the news conference, posted on the Facebook page of the ACLU a dub V, that his arrest sets a terrible example for members of the media seeking answers. This is my job. This is what I'm supposed to do. I think it's a question that deserves to be answered. I think it's my job to ask questions, and I think it's my job to try to get answers. ACLU of West Virginia called the charges outrageous and said the arrest was a blatant attempt to chill an independent free press. A dangerous time in the country. Indeed. Now, interestingly enough, the previous HHS secretary, just I think on the tail end of the Obama administration, was actually a West Virginia-born person. Person. So that's a little bit of breaking news for you. And again, everything we say and play will always be included in the show notes, and we tweet out the stories that we're going to talk about at least an hour before showtime. So if you're listening to the show live, you can see exactly the stories that we're talking about and where we're going to go next. An emergency was declared Tuesday at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in southeastern Washington after a portion of a tunnel that contains rail cars full of nuclear waste collapsed. The alert, which was later expanded to a site area emergency, was activated shortly before 8.30 a.m. at the Hanford Emergency Operations Center, according to the U.S. Department of Energy. Which is being run by Rick Perry now? Is that right? Good God. The accident occurred at the Plutonium Uranium Extraction Facility, Purex, located in the middle of the sprawling Hanford site, which is half the size of Rhode Island. The closed Purex plant was part of the nation's nuclear weapons production complex. Authorities say the collapse took place within one of the two rail tunnels under the Purex site, which contains contaminated materials. One tunnel is about 360 feet long and the other spans 1,700 feet. The partial collapse, which covered about 400 square feet, took place in an area where the two tunnels joined together. The incident caused the soil above the tunnel to sink between two and four feet. The discovery of subsided soil was made during routine surveillance of a 20-foot area in the tunnel, and I definitely saw people point out all those sensors, all those cameras, all those computers, and it was still just people that found it. No workers were inside the tunnel when it collapsed, but nearby crews were evacuated as a precaution. Some employees were asked to secure ventilation and shelter indoors, while others were sent home early. Woohoo! Snow day. The entrance to the site has been restricted. This is a serious situation, Washington State Governor Jay Inslee said in a written statement. Ensuring the safety of the workers and the community is the top priority. Crews are currently surveying the area near the Purex tunnels for contamination. At this time, no radiation has been detected. According to the Department of Energy, the collapse may have been caused by road crews doing construction above the tunnel location. The level of concern for significant danger at the site has subsided. So it's all okay now, right? Federal, state, and local officials are coordinating closely on the response. We will continue to monitor the situation and assist the federal government in its response. Tunnel collapse at Hanford Nuclear Site, an emergency declared. We begin at the Hanford Nuclear Waste Site in Washington State, where an emergency mode was activated this morning. Part of a tunnel at the plutonium extract plant collapsed, and workers were told to take cover. Later, this status expanded to the entire site, which is about the size of the state of Rhode Island. Authorities say no one was injured and no radiation leak has been detected. I'm joined now by RT's Alexei Urshevsky, who extensively covered uh, that site last year. Alexei, what do we know about today's incident at this point? So what we do know is that this happened at 8 o'clock in the morning uh, at uh, one part of the uh, nuclear waste site, which is huge, as you just mentioned. It's part of the tunnel which was carrying uh, radioactive materials, which collapsed. And now the Hanford website actually distributed a picture of a hole uh, in the roof of that tunnel. It's a 20 by 20 feet hole uh, in a tunnel which is hundreds of feet long. And um, the most likely reason for that is vibrations produced by nearby roadwork. Roadwork at a nuclear waste site. How crazy does that sound? Um, 
It is quite unsafe, yeah. So we know that this tunnel is used to transport nuclear uh, fuel rods. Um, and the building the itself, which um, is adjoining this tunnel, has been vacant for 20 years, uh, but still remains highly contaminated, according to the Hanford website. Now, there's a statement as well from the Hanford website saying that there are concerns about subsidence in the soil covering railroad tunnels near a former chemical processing facility. And that tunnel, as according to Hanford authorities, does indeed contain contaminated materials. Now, the go-to person when it comes to Hanford, the local news reporter from King 5 uh, station, Susanna Frame, had a series of tweets this morning, first of all saying that the Hanford Emergency Operations Center was activated at 8.26 a.m. Veteran workers think it's the first time open for possible radioactive release. Highly contaminated items, she continued, were stored in the tunnel that has collapsed at Hanford and that the Hanford um, facility calls this a crisis. She also posted a picture, a photo of a massive plutonium finishing plant, which is called um, Purex, uh, the, the, where the tunnel is situated, and that tunnel has collapsed, leading to this building. Uh, she also said that the Hanford update from source, meaning that take cover status expanded to the entire site, which is again almost the size of Rhode Island. And finally, this sounds quite scary, that one of her sources, and this woman has a lot of sources from the inside of Hanford, said that this was the biggest deal he's seen at Hanford in 35 years of working there. So for now, the authorities claim everything is contained, there's no radioaction, radioactive leak, and no one got injured. Uh, but there's no immediate update as to whether the emergency mode has been lifted. Um, we never know whether this is as scary as it as we believe it to be. Right, and this kind of crisis seems to have been a long time coming, remembering the reports you filed there last year. The Hanford site has been subject to uh, a lot of worry uh, in, in recent months. Why is that? Well, the, it got a, a nickname of a most toxic place in America for a good reason. Uh, it's been in a clear-up mode since 1989. It was shut down in 1980. And I'd like to remind that Hanford facilities where the plutonium for the Fat Man bomb dropped on Japan was produced. Um, but the shells where they keep the radioactive, radioactive waste are, have been leaking. And just last year, we had a news peg of going there. Several workers, actually several dozen of workers, got injured by inhaling toxic fumes. Ever since then, uh, it's been happening uh, on and off. And um, there's been a lawsuit filed by the workers at Hanford against the authorities who were not compensating the health uh, risks properly. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, this is a one very problematic site, and we covered it last year. But the local reporters have been covering it for years. And if you look at the screens of the main, major mainstream media networks today, there's not a word said about this uh, rather serious incident at Washington State. It's a serious incident at a site that's actually in the process of, like you said, being shut down. It sounds like a good case for the long-term risks nuclear energy uh, poses, uh, because it seems like we're still dealing with serious, serious risks there. Speaking of long-term risks, I mean, how about the irony of... The bombs we dropped to kill come back to kill us decades later. Now, our buddy Chef Jake up in Washington State. He just noted that on Google Maps, Hanford shows up as Arid Land Ecology Reservation. And of course, they color it all green. It's all green. Maybe the other idea in the chat, we should call the Department of Energy the green energy. Then all the problems would go away, right? Longtime listeners to Media Monarchy know that we've talked about this for years. I just hit up my own archives at MediaMonarchy.com. And again, we've been online since September 11th, 2005. We've been doing this for nearly 12 years. Posted to MediaMonarchy.com July 19th, 2008. One of the most contaminated places on Earth will only get dirtier if the U.S. government doesn't get, an act, get its act together. Cleanup plans are already 19 years behind schedule and not due for completion until 2050. 2050. More than 210 million liters of radioactive and chemical waste are stored in 177 underground tanks at Hanford in Washington State. Most are over 50 years old. Already, 67 of the tanks have failed, leaking almost 4 million liters of waste into the ground. There are now serious questions about the tank's long-term viability, says a Government Accountability Office report, which strongly criticizes the U.S. Department of Energy for delaying an $8 billion program to empty the tanks and treat the waste. The DOE's plan, however, is faith-based. Remember when we used to use that term? Says Robert Alvarez, an authority on Hanford at the Institute for Policy Studies in D.C., the risks of catastrophic tank failure will sharply increase as each year goes by. In one of the nation's largest rivers, the Columbia, 
will be in jeopardy. The Columbia River flows down towards right here. The Columbia River essentially makes up the border between Oregon and Washington State. It's very close. A little too close to home. Now, I'm stoked actually to see, I just checked a little bit ago as well, that my old buddy Clyde Lewis did a full episode last night on this new situation on Ground Zero. And even back when I was the producer of Ground Zero, back in 2012 to 2014, we did shows about Hanford and had guests on and specifically talked about it. In the show description for Clyde's show last night, New Clear Tunnel Vision, one of the most toxic places on the planet, the Hanford nuclear site had a tunnel collapse containing nuclear waste. Of course, the mainstream media is conveniently downplaying the severity of the disaster. Additionally, a fire near Fukushima is releasing contaminated radioactive ash into the air. So last night on Ground Zero, Clyde talked with activist and director of No Nukes Northwest, Amber King. And again, we'll include that in the show notes as well. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Wednesday, May 10th, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Trying to give you a look at what's really going on in the world. And Wednesdays, we talk food, health, and environment news. And we call it Food World Order. So we'll go from Hanford to another toxic place. And that's the Gaza Strip. Israeli planes have reportedly sprayed toxic chemical substances and dangerous pesticides on farmlands across the besieged Gaza Strip in yet another act of aggression against the besieged Palestinian coastal enclave. Now, this comes from Press TV, so it's, of course, going to come with a little bit of their slanted take. Pretty well justified, though. Local sources speaking on condition of anonymity told Arabic-language Wafa news agency on Tuesday that the area between the southern Gaza Strip of Khan Yunus and the central Gaza Strip city of Deir al-Bala have been affected as a result. The sources added that Israeli military forces have threatened to open fire on shepherds and farmers if they approach those regions. This is not the first time that Israeli aircraft poison Palestinian produce by spraying harmful substances on them. On April 4th, Israeli drones that sprayed weed killers and pesticides on Palestinian crops in the eastern parts of the Gaza Strip. Palestinian farmers, again requesting anonymity, said melon, watermelon, okra, and wheat fields close to Israeli checkpoints were sprayed with poisonous pesticides and weed killers. Local farmers said Israeli troops spray weed killers to dry wild plants around security fences in order to have clear vision. New clear vision to watch the area, but they usually spray dozens of meters around their targeted areas, killing and damaging Palestinian crops. The continuing Israeli blockade of the Gaza Strip is putting the lives of people at risk, taking a heavy toll on the enclave's agricultural sector. Farmers are struggling to meet the growing demands of 1.8 million Gazans who are living in the tight grip of the Israeli siege. They face many challenges due to shortages in farming equipment and, more importantly, approved pesticides. Due to the decline in production and Israel's ban on the entry of basic commodities, Gazan farmers have resorted to the use of banned chemical substances to maximize crop yield. This poses a serious health hazard to both farmers and their consumers. Meanwhile, the United Nations has expressed concerns over the excessive use of toxic pesticides by Gaza farmers. Many medical experts in Gaza are worried about a rise in the number of registered Gazan cancer patients especially in the agricultural areas. They warn that children are, of course, more susceptible to diseases such as leukemia than adults in such places. Gaza Strip's been under Israel's blockade since June 2007. Crippling sieges caused decline in living standards as well as unprecedented levels of unemployment and unrelenting poverty. Israel launched its latest war on the Gaza Strip in early July 2014. Nearly 2,200 Palestinians, including 577 children, were killed in Israel's 50-day onslaught. Over 11,000 others, including 3,000-plus kids, 2,000-plus women, and 400-plus elderly people, were also injured. Israel sprays Palestinian farmlands in Gaza with toxic pesticides. The Gaza Strip has been under Israel's land, sea, and air blockade for years now. This has caused many problems for Palestinians living in the blockaded territory. And it's not all. Palestinians in Gaza are also subject to other acts of hostility by Israel which make livelihood difficult for them. Sometimes it's threatening. Palestinians say Israeli forces open fire on their farmlands, bulldoze them, and spray them with toxic pesticides. Early this week, Israeli planes sprayed Palestinian farmlands with toxic pesticides. Farmers say the action threatens agriculture in the Gaza Strip, which is one of the main sources of livelihood in the blockaded territory. 
إسرائيل يعني بدأت تخلي المزارعين Israel wants to prevent us from farming on our lands to turn them into bleak landscapes. Israel sprayed my land with toxic pesticide this week and damaged crops. We were also affected. I've been farming here since 2004. Israel has also kept opening fire on our lands. The Ministry of Agriculture has officially asked the Red Cross to interfere. However, they were only able to provide information about the toxic spraying time period. Officials at the ministry say what Israel does is a violation of the rights of the Palestinian farmers. The toxic pesticides Israel sprays damage the crops and sometimes prevent the germination of seeds in the soil. They also affect the planting process in the future and take long periods of time to be broken into the soil. Spraying these pesticides in places where farmers grow vegetables violates their rights. The problems caused by Israel's spraying toxic pesticides just add to the misery of the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Here, living conditions are already hard due to the Israeli restrictions, which, among other things, have weakened economy in the blockaded territory. So that clip, as well as the preceding article, actually both come from Press TV. And one of the questions asked on the tweets, do they use the same pesticides on their crops? I mean, that would be the irony, wouldn't it? One place doesn't want it, but the other place, no, this is great. We love Roundup. And actually, I've got, a, I think, a good news story about Roundup coming up at the end of this episode that features a couple of good news notes. They might get filed under not unmitigated good news. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy. I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Another story concerning the apartheid state of Israel. As Palestinian prisoners ended a third week of a mass hunger strike, Israel released videos that said showed the strike leader, Marwan Barghouti, sneaking snacks in his cell, snacking off in his cell. Palestinian leaders dismissed the videos released on Sunday as fakes aimed at deflating the strike of over a thousand prisoners, which has stirred protests and clashes with security forces in Palestinian areas. The prisoners are demanding better conditions in Israeli jails. Prison officials said the videos show Mr. Barghouti, the strike's organizer, eating cookies on April 27th and then a candy bar on Friday. He's being held in solitary confinement at the Kishon prison. Israel's public public security minister, Gilad Erdin, said the strike was not about prison conditions, which he said exceeded international standards, but about Mr. Barghouti's political goals. The serving life sentences for five murders during the Second Intifada of the early 2000s, Mr. Barghouti, 57, is popular among Palestinians and is seen as a possible successor to the unpopular Palestinian Authority leader Mahmoud Abbas, who's 82. Barghouti is a murderer and a hypocrite who urged his fellow prisoners to strike and suffer while he ate behind their back. Israel will not give in to extortion and pressure from terrorists. Palestinian officials organized the strike organizing the strike called the videos filmed from above absurd and we'll include in the show notes the links to Haaretz who has put the entire I suppose the entire 10 minute video up on YouTube no sound it's just a little surveillance camera basically from above his cell it shows him basically pacing back and forth and you can see him kind of unwrap and eat stuff 10 minutes of it a little bit of overkill. Palestinian officials organizing the strike called the videos filmed from above absurd. Mr. Barghouti's wife, Fadwa, told reporters in Ramallah, West Bank, that Israel was trying to stop the strike in any way, resorting to despicable acts, but that this video will increase the prisoners' insistence on continuing. The strikers' demands include more family visits and access to education, an end to solitary confinement, and better health care. Sounds like what everybody wants, right? Organizers say the prisoners, some of whom have fallen ill, have survived on only water and salt. Israeli officials allege that some are taking vitamin supplements. While Mr. Barghouti and most of the other strikers belong to Mr. Abbas's Fatah party, some belong to the rival Hamas, which governs the Gaza Strip. About 6,500 Palestinians are in Israeli prisons. In Gaza, Maryam Abu Daka of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine called the videos a false attempt to create chaos in the movement. The strike will continue un- until Palestinians' just demands are met. Now again, I've got the video all linked up for you. It doesn't look like a faked thing. It looks pretty much like he's rolling around in his cell having some snacks. Let's continue to pile on the propaganda, my friends. And it's going to get deep. You might want to put on your waders for this one. Throughout history... 
<clears throat> Hold on, let me get my get my movie uh, movie voiceover thing. <clears throat> there are diseases hidden in ice, and they are waking up. Long dormant bacteria and viruses trapped in ice and permafrost for centuries are reviving as Earth's climate warms. Throughout history, humans have existed side by side with bacteria and viruses. From the bubonic plague to smallpox, we have evolved to resist them. And in response, they've developed new ways of infecting us. How's that? We've had antibiotics for almost a century, ever since Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. In response, bacteria have responded by evolving antibiotic resistance. The battle's endless. Because we spend so much time with pathogens, we sometimes develop a kind of natural stalemate. However, what would happen in a world if we were suddenly exposed to deadly bacteria and viruses that have been absent for thousands of years or that we never even met at all? We may be about to find out. Climate change is melting permafrost soils that have been frozen for thousands of years, and as the soils melt, they are releasing ancient viruses and bacteria that, having lain dormant, are springing back to life. In August 2016, in a remote corner of Siberian tundra called the Yamal Peninsula in the Arctic Circle, a 12-year-old boy died, and at least 20 other people were hospitalized after being infected by anthrax. Theories that over 75 years ago, a reindeer infected with anthrax died, and its frozen carcass became trapped under a layer of frozen soil known as permafrost. There it stayed until a heat wave in the summer of 2016 when the permafrost thawed. This exposed the reindeer corpse and released infectious anthrax into nearby water and soil and then into the food supply. More than 2,000 reindeer grazing nearby became infected, which then led to the small number of human cases. The fear is that this will not be an isolated case. So this bit of massive propaganda coming from the BBC is really only trumped by... <laughs> is only trumped by the video I found from some new channel on YouTube, but they've already got the little verified check mark, so they must be legit, right? Diseases hidden in ice are waking up due to global warming. Bacteria and viruses have existed for millennia, and humans have evolved to develop immunity to some of them. Unfortunately, bacteria have also evolved. Bacteria can actually survive in permafrost for millions of years. But permafrost soils are slowly melting because of rising global temperatures. And because the frost is melting, the diseases and deadly bacteria are also getting released. Some of these viruses have been absent for over a thousand years. Back in 2015, a 12-year-old boy from Siberia died from being infected by anthrax. Anthrax was first recorded back in 1398. It's also known as the Siberian Plague. Scientists believe that a reindeer infected by anthrax died, and its body remained under a layer of frozen soil. According to evolutionary biologist Jean-Michel Claverie, permafrost is a very good preserver of microbes and viruses because it's cold, there's no oxygen, and it's dark. Pathogenic viruses that can infect humans or animals might be preserved in old permafrost layers, including some that have caused global epidemics in the past. There was a heat wave in the summer of 2016 that thawed out this permafrost, and then that released the anthrax. The disease seeped into nearby water, ended up in the soil, and eventually food supply. And the concern isn't only this one disease. It is very possible that other diseases could be released as well. Scientists have discovered the Spanish flu virus in corpses buried in the Alaskan mass graves. The Spanish flu pandemic killed 50 to 100 million people worldwide between 1918 and 1919, and it gets worse. The bubonic plague and smallpox are also buried in Siberia. Both these diseases are terrible and unsightly to say the least. Needless to say, this is very worrisome. The world definitely does not need another bubonic plague pandemic like the one in the Middle Ages. It was nicknamed the Black Death and it killed anywhere from 75 million to 100 people between 1346 and 1353. So how are we going to stop these deadly diseases from waking up and coming back to wreak havoc on humankind? Well, solving global Global warming is probably the best thing to do. Make the global temperature stop rising and the diseases will stay locked up in permafrost. Something tells me though it's going to take a pandemic for people to wake up and realize that we need to start treating our planet better. Okay guys, it's time to respond to some previous potato comments. These are from our video. Scientists may have figured out how to stop global warming. Good video. Definitely check it out if you haven't already. FaZe Ram said, global warming doesn't exist. Cool dude, so are you like a scientist or something? Because I know like a lot of scientists say that it does. In fact, the doomsday clock 
clock, a theoretical clock that measures how close we are to a human-caused global catastrophe, got closer to midnight since 2007 because of global warming. It was founded by the Manhattan Project, who were the scientists that designed the actual atomic bombs. But we shouldn't listen to them, right? What do they know? Where did you get this? The alternative media, Jerry. That's where you hear the truth. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Like, oh my God, I, I don't know if I still have any listeners or not because of that awful bullshit clip I just played. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Wednesday, May 10th, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. I'll put that clip in the show notes so you can watch the whole thing because I know you, you'll be excited to learn that wasn't the entire thing. I even edited it down just a little bit. The propaganda is thick, my friends. But as, as is noted in the chat, that is a pretty enlightening clip in terms of the mindset involved. The other two points to note, or the other two notes to point, X-Files and The Thing. Is this essentially storyline of X-Files episodes is the, the Black Tar episodes? And this, is that also essentially the plot of The Thing? Of course, the original film and then the John Carpenter super grody remake. Perhaps we'll have to talk about those on future Deep Focus segments. So let's move from the propaganda into areas of basically shutdown here back in the States. Advocate Healthcare, the largest hospital network in Illinois, plans to cut $200 million in expenses as financial pressures mount. Jim Skosberg, CEO of the Downers Grove-based health system, insists the big spending reduction isn't related to advocates' lengthy battle trying to merge with Evanston-based North Shore University Health System. The systems lost their court fight against the Federal Trade Commission in March, then called off their proposed marriage. Advocates spent $15 million in legal fees and other expenses related to the merger. If we came together, we probably would have had a better opportunity to weather the storm, but the storm was coming. God, these are all so great. I could read these all in the movie voice. Instead, the $200 million in cuts are fueled by many of the concerns his COO described in April when confirming a system-wide hiring freeze. So this is just one healthcare place in one state, but it's playing out everywhere. It's kind of hilarious here in Oregon. Moda Health, M-O-D-A. Big healthcare place. Of course, they exploded during the Obamacare push. They even got the naming rights of the stadium in town that had always been called the Rose Garden. Not a corporate name. It describes the city of roses, and it fit perfectly. Now it's called the Moda Center. Moda, however, pretty much went bankrupt recently. But they still get that naming. So let's go from Illinois... Up to Minnesota, as Kellogg is laying off more than 200 Twin City-based workers. The cuts are part of a larger national cost-cutting initiative that the maker of Raisin Bran announced in February, said Joe Lears, Kellogg's director of labor relations. This is directly related to that, he said by phone on Monday, and it's one in a series of layoff announcements nationwide. The Battle Creek, Michigan-based maker of Cheez-It crackers and Nutri-Grain bars, I like how they're slipping in all of the, they also make delicious Cheez-Its. They're dismantling its direct store delivery system called DSD, used for its snacking off business. The move, like those taken by several other major food companies, is a way to save money in the face of consumer trends challenging the packaged foods industry. While the announcement was made months ago, the company had not yet revealed which employees and what locations would be affected. They were keeping it a surprise. The letter, dated May 4th and sent to the Department of Employment and Economic Development, DEED, says 260 workers at its Vodney Heights Distribution Center will be permanently laid off in July and August. The jobs include both on-site warehouse employees and truck drivers. Some of the employees are represented by Teamsters Local 471. Dave Laxon, the union's top elected official, has not returned requests for comment. This is coming from the Star Tribune. We've been actively engaged in conversations with some of our biggest retail partners who have expressed strong interest in hiring these employees for high-demand roles once the transition is complete. We're sorry, but you're no longer needed, or wanted, or even cared about. Soup is good food. We don't need you anymore. Kraft Heinz will cut 
5,150. Yes, 5150. That means you're insane and getting put away. Kraft Heinz will cut 5150 jobs and close six factories, laying off 13% of its workforce in a bid to further cut costs at one of the world's largest packaged food companies. The decision is the latest in a series of aggressive cost-cutting maneuvers by the company, which merged in 2015 amid pledge to make both brands more efficient, Kraft Heinz. The company announced the cuts a day after it failed to meet analyst revenue and earning projections for the first quarter of 2017. Company executives blamed slumping consumption for falling short of expectations for a fourth time in the last five quarters. That's, that's exactly it. People aren't buying your packaged crap anymore. And the way the massive corporate system works is you have to constantly grow. If you're not constantly growing and absorbing everything around you like the blob, to mention another horror film, well, your board's not going to be happy. Analysts told Bloomberg Kraft Heinz needed to continue expanding its brand offerings to grow revenue in a difficult market for packaged foods. The company's bid to buy European company Unilever failed after Unilever executives feared a culture clash between its socially conscious brands because they buy up things like 7th Generation and Ben & Jerry's. Of course, those companies are instantly fucking sellouts and I don't buy them anymore. But they're socially conscious, right? Got another sellout story coming up for you in just a couple of minutes out of North Carolina. But they are worried about the culture clash between their socially conscious brands and the reputation Kraft Heinz has as developed for deep cost cutting. Heinz, which is backed by the private equity firm 3G and Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, we mention them every day this week it seems, merged with the publicly traded Kraft in 2015. About 70% of the company's sales are generated by the namesake condiment brands Velveeta Cheese and Oscar Mayer Hot Dogs. Analysts said the company will need to broaden its horizons and not just cut costs in order to reverse these flagging revenues. They need to show that they're more than just a financial engineer, that they can run a food business in a challenging environment. The jury is still out. Now, an article over on Bloomberg points out why perhaps the retail crisis could be coming to American grocery stores. The American grocery store has so far been immune to the ravages of online shopping and the all-around apocalyptic outlook facing the nation's retailers, but a war is coming to the stayed supermarket, and that could mean more consolidation, bankruptcies, and falling prices. An invasion is getting underway. Little, is that how you pronounce it? L-I-D-L, a German retailer known for low prices and efficient ops, is expected to start an aggressive U.S. expansion in the coming weeks that could open as many as 100 new stores across the East Coast by the summer of 2018. The company, which runs about 10,000 stores in Europe, also set its sights on Texas, one of the most competitive grocery markets in the U.S. Analysts expect little to expand to nearly $9 billion in sales by 2023. Grocery stores are massively going to change. Now, I'm starting to run out of time here, and I've still got a slew of stories I want to discuss. There's a good one on thesleuthjournal.com. 30 easy spending cuts to make your prepping possible. Some of these are similar, but a lot of these are really good, simple ideas that hopefully we all do a little bit of. Drink water. Join a farm co-op. Stop buying expensive ass drive through coffee. Brown bag it to work. Skip the meat. Cancel your cable or satellite. Lower your thermostat. Don't use credit cards. Shop around for car and home insurance. Grow your own veggies and herbs. Take shorter showers. Make homemade pizza. Hang your clothes to dry. Wash your clothes in cold water. Don't throw away your leftovers. Eat at home. Shop secondhand. Stay healthy. Prep your food ahead of time. Skip the gym and just work out outside. Quit smoking. DIY your hair color. Ditch the fake nails. Clip coupons. Skip the fancy cleaning supplies because you can pretty much just use peroxide and baking soda for vinegar for pretty much everything. Repair instead of replace. Skip that doggy beauty salon and stay home. Those are all pretty easy things to do, and I bet a lot of us do a lot of those things. Good news for sustainable farmers, possibly. The National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition says there's good news in the administration's upcoming spending bill for fiscal year 2017. 1.5 bill for the Farm Service Agency, Rural Development, Agricultural Food Research, Conservation, 
No cuts to funds for the Conservation Stewardship Program or Organic Agricultural Research and Extension Initiatives. And there appears to not be any bad policy writers, you know, where they tackle on the extra things. CRISPR is killing it. The CRISPR gene editing tool has already shown a lot of potential for helping doctors treat the most stubborn diseases. And now scientists have used it to target the command center of cancerous tumors, stopping their growth and boosting survival rates in mice. In a new study, CRISPR, which we've talked about pretty extensively on New World Next Week, C-R-I-S-P-R, was aimed directly at fusion genes formed when two genes combine to form a hybrid, resulting in abnormal proteins which often cause cancer or help it to grow. These fusion genes also have unique DNA fingerprint, which researchers from the University of Pittsburgh were able to use to hunt down and modify them. Specifically engineered viruses were then applied to replace the fusion genes with cancer-killing ones. This is the first time that gene editing has been used to specifically target cancer fusion genes. It's really exciting because it lays the groundwork for what could become a totally new approach to treating cancer. Now, was there also a different story about... CRISPR removing, I'm pulling this off the top of my head, killing AIDS in some kind of animals. We'll have to look that up as we continue to get all the Food World Order news. And we go now, as I said, to North Carolina. Within an hours of announcing its sale to the maker of Budweiser, you know, the great American beer, haha, North Carolina's beloved Wicked Weed beer lost its voting rights in a craft beer guild, was booted from collaborations with two independent breweries, and was exiled from at least a handful of stores and restaurants. The deal announced last Wednesday represents the latest front in a battle between macro and micro brewers. As behemoths such as Anheuser-Busch InBev acquire independent brewers to harness the craft segment's fast growth. Wicked Weed will be one of a dozen brands in Anheuser-Busch's unit called The High End, which includes Breckenridge Brewery in Colorado and Goose Island in Illinois. Our consumers are very, very passionate consumers, said Walt Dickinson, who co-founded Wicked Weed in 2012. Way back in 2012. They feel passionate about the brand. I'm respectful of their feelings. It's going to be our job going forward to win them back and show them that we're the exact same people. But you're not the exact same people. You're corporate sellout whores. That's what you are. That's what you expose yourself to be. The ingredients might not change at all. But it's who's bringing those ingredients. Wicked Weed beer sale marks flashpoint in brewery turf wars. As long as as we're talking about the hooch, which I did see in the chat when we were looking at ways to save money. People say, is bourbon still okay? Bourbon is still okay. I give you the go-ahead for that. A quality assurance team found that some bottles of Bombay Sapphire. Now that's some top shelf shit. That ain't no, that ain't no rail rock gut stuff. A quality assurance team found that some bottles of Bombay Sapphire had almost double the amount of alcohol in them than what was advertised. Congratulations to all the Canadians who've done dumb shit while bombed on Bombay Sapphire in the past couple of months. You just earned yourself a hell of an excuse. You can now explain some of it away because, as it turns out, some bottles of Bombay Sapphire were a lot fucking stronger than advertised. This is from the classy folks at Vice. So if you punched a fist through your Corvette window, slept with that person at the bar you really shouldn't have slept with, or stole your neighbor's cats, well, it's now on the gin. We know this because an investigation by the Liquor Control Board of Ontario Quality Assurance Team found that some of the gin was a little more ginny than it should have been. This recall was initiated after an investigation by LCBO Quality Assurance revealed a deviation in the stated 40% alcohol content by volume ABV. Which is interesting. That almost sounds exactly like Anheuser-Busch InBev. Isn't that funny? Hmm. Do you think they maybe engineered their name to sound like alcohol by volume? Ooh, I like that. Gin pulled from shelves after discovery that some bottles contain 77% of alcohol. And our friend Nicole Redu, on the tweets at Booze Leprechaun, appropriately enough, says, I, I fail to see the problem. And we reach our final story on the Food World Order menu today, my friends. A new type of Roundup is on sale in Austrian garden centers. It's the same old bottle with the same old familiar brand name, still marketed by Scott's under license from Monsanto. The only difference compared with the old-style Roundup is that the new one has a prominent label on the front saying it's formulated without glyphosate. On the back, on the ingredients label, the active substance is defined as none other than, what did I just say a minute ago, fucking vinegar. 
The new product was bought by Dr. Helmut Bertscher, a biochemist who chem, biochemist who works for the Vienna-based NGO Global 2000 in a garden center in Vienna. He learned of the glyphosate-free Roundup in a brochure sent to his house advertising new products. His reaction, laughter. I laughed. But then I went quickly to the store to see if it was really true or a joke. It was real. Why does Bercher think that Scott's brought out this product? The World Health Organization's cancer agency, IARC, has stated that glyphosate was a probable human carcinogen. Monsanto admitted in court that it cannot claim that Roundup doesn't cause cancer because the complete formulation has never been tested. Garden centers are wondering what to tell their customers. They've undoubtedly lost business. Some have phased out all chemical pesticides, such as Bellaflora, which took this step in cooperation with Global 2000 long before the IARC came out with its verdict. Bircher said that in the case of Bellaflora, the NGO didn't need to apply much pressure. The expertise came from the company. Now they only sell organic-approved plant protection products. But why does Bircher think Scott's are calling its new vinegar-based herbicide Roundup? Maybe Scott's thought, we need this trade name because people see Roundup as more effective than vinegar. Bircher spent about 30 euros on the glyphosate-free Roundup. It says in the future he'll just buy vinegar if it works out cheaper. It might also be, it might, might also be safer, he adds, since we don't know if the vinegar-based Roundup formulation still contains the toxic adjuvants, additives present in glyphosate herbicide formulations that are designed to increase the toxicity of glyphosate to plants. But if Scott's can prove the safety of the adjuvants, Bircher said it's a win-win situation. It's a victory for Monsanto because now it has a product that doesn't cause harm and a victory for people in the environment. As this article on GM Watch notes, one thing is certain, glyphosate-free Roundup is a product whose time has come. All those stories are available right in the Twitter moment that we post up before showtime. And if you really want to go nutso, you can just check out hashtag food world order. And that has all the other stories submitted, all the other news, all the recalls, tons of news. If you just hit the hashtag of any day of media monarchy subjects, there is a wealth of news. Like I say, generally we only hit about a dozen or so stories each day and the rest, just tons of news out there. And again, it is brought to you by you. We're going to go out with music from Rack and Rostam, and I'll tell you a little bit more about who they are after this day in history, my friends. May 10th, 1824, the National Gallery in London opens to the public. And on May 10th, 1849, a riot breaks out at the Astor Opera House in Manhattan. Over a dispute between actors Edwin Forrest and William Charles McCready, killing at least 25 and injuring over 120. It's called the Astor Place Riot. In 1849, a violent riot protesting an English actor's performance of Macbeth over an American actor's performance led to 25 New Yorkers being shot dead by the state's militia at the intersection of Astor Place, Lafayette, and 4th Avenue. Jonathan Ward's drama, Bahoy's Do Macbeth, tells the authentic story of Pete Williams, a successful African-American proprietor of All Mac Dance Hall in Manhattan's Violent Five Points, caught in a squeeze that leads into the explosion of the Astor Place Opera House Riot, one of the bloodiest riots in the history of New York City. With two competing productions of Macbeth being staged within a block of each other, one featuring the English actor William McReady and the other starring the popular American actor Edwin Forrest, a political and social powder keg was ignited by the emerging Tammany machine. While inside the opera house, hundreds of vegetable-tossing rabble-rousers forced the English actors to flee the stage. Outside, thousands of New York citizens raised their voices to protest the local government's callousness and lack of concern to their economic plight. Just a half block north of today's public theater, and a half block west of Cooper Union, where the Alamo Cube revolves on its single pivot point. After a round of warning shots, 350 members of the New York State Militia fired point-blank at the ensuing mob. 25 New York citizens were killed and scores more were wounded and injured. The Opera House could not survive its reputation as the Disaster Place Opera House. By May 1853, the interior had been dismantled and the shell of the building sold to the New York Mercantile Library. In 1890, the association tore down the Opera House building and replaced it with an 11-story building which, 
recently converted into condominiums, still stands on the site today. The Astor Place Riots on this day in history, May 10, 1849. May 10, 1876, the Centennial Expositions open in Philadelphia by U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant and Brazilian Emperor Dom Pedro II. May 10, 1924, gotta love these sinks. Now, I know a lot of people were pointing out yesterday as Trump fired Comey that it was the same day as we had noted on yesterday morning's day in history. That it was the opening of impeachment proceedings against Nixon. So they're trying to, of course, find the comparisons between that and Trump. May 10th, 1924, J. Edgar Hoover is appointed the first director of the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation and remains so until his death in 1972. Past is prologue, just as was pointed out in the chat about those riots. Not to say that any death isn't a tragedy, but we get a little bent out of shape about the events that happen now, and we forget America's essentially a big, bloody, haunted house. And that is our prologue. May 10th, 1940, Winston Churchill is appointed Prime Minister of the UK following the resignation of Neville Chamberlain. 1941, Rudolf Hess parachutes into Scotland to try and negotiate a peace deal between the UK and Nazi Germany. May 10th, 1962, Marvel Comics publishes the first issue of The Incredible Hulk. May 10th, 1975, Sony introduces the Betamax video cassette recorder in Japan. 1994, Nelson Mandela inaugurated as South Africa's first black president on this day in 1994. May 10th, 2002, FBI agent Robert Hansen sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for selling United States secrets to Russia for $1.4 million in cash and diamonds. Of course, there's a film. Now the title of it escapes me. It's got Chris Cooper and Ryan Philippe. All about that story. May 10th, 2005, a hand grenade thrown by Vladimir Artunian lands about 65 feet away from George Bush while he's giving a speech to a crowd in Tbilisi, Georgia, but it malfunctions and does not detonate. Of course, it would be a few years later before someone just started throwing shoes at him. Finally, May 10th, 2013, One World Trade Center becomes the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere. As long as we're talking about the World Trade Center, posted to Media Monarchy a decade ago today, May 10th, 2007, Fox News tried to paint Senator John Kerry as a 9-11 conspiracy theorist based on a brief statement Kerry made about the controlled demolition of a wall at one of the World Trade Center buildings. Fox tried to make the case that the 9-11 conspiracy theorists had bonded with him. At the beginning of the show, a Chiron read, The Crazies Love Him, as Sean Hannity announced the upcoming Carrie segment. Posted a decade ago today on MediaMonarchy.com, Fox tries to link Carrie to 9-11 conspiracy theorists. It sounds hilarious thinking about that today, of all the things that we now know. Which again, I think it should be a constant reminder not to get too bent out of shape or too rah-rah-rah about any fake political heroes or fake political movements. It seems to me it all basically turns into a bunch of bullshit. That's just me. Celebrating birthdays today? Pretty interesting. John Wilkes Booth, born on this day in 1838. Two early, very important film composers, Max Steiner and Dmitry Timokhin, both born on this day, 1888 and 1894, respectively. It's also Fred Astaire's birthday. David O. Selznick, that's right, the David O. Selznick, born on this day in 1902. Kung Fu Fighting's Carl Douglas. It's also Donovan's birthday. Mark David Chapman's birthday. Sid Vicious. Rick Santorum. Bono. And also American rapper and producer Craig Mack. That's kind of a rogues gallery of birthdays today. I don't know if any of those musical folks will make their way into our daily DJ set at noon, although I might have some Max Steiner music. But as we wrap up this episode, I'm going to have some music from Grammy Award winner Rack, all capitalized R-A-C, a.k.a. Andre Allen Anhos. He's got a highly anticipated new record coming out this summer, and the first single is a collaboration with Rostam, which I did not know until I read this from KCRW, was formerly of Vampire Weekend. That might explain why there hasn't been a Vampire Weekend record now in almost five years. Their main songwriter left the group, I didn't know that. So we're going to listen to this song. 
and it also marks the 10th anniversary of Rack starting to make music in his dorm. Because that's how you can do things. Just DIY, my friends. That's why we've built our own new stream. It is up. It is live. We'll continue to do what we've done Monday and Tuesday of this week. I basically start the stream at about 8.30 in the morning, and I'll stream it until 5 in the afternoon. Yesterday, we listened to the press conference hearings, the Sean Spicer White House dealie. We heard the Pally, uh, Sally Yates testimony the other day. Listen to some news bits. Listen to some music. We are smoke testing the new stream, my friends, and we are excited. We are going forward boldly, as our buddy Jack Blood would say, to make media for ourselves. And it is all brought to you by you. MediaMonarchy.com slash support keeps us going and growing and moving and grooving, my friends. So there you have it, your Food World Order episode for Wednesday, May 10th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Thanking you so much for listening, my friends, and reminding you, as always, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.